Welcome everyone, another live stream in the books. Wednesday nights is when we typically do it, five o'clock Pacific Standard Time. And tonight's topic we got from Facebook. So if you're not following us on Facebook already, you should, uh, right? Oh, it's the wrong way, right there. You can see we have over 100,000 people on Facebook page. And yesterday I asked, what do you guys wanna hear about? And the one that got the most likes was uh, kind of what to watch out for, when this happens, what else is going to happen down the road, and that's what this episode is about. So, um, in the thumbnail picture, you might have seen there was a bunch of bubbles up top. Well, that can be a couple of things, and so it's something that I know in my own store, my own tanks, definitely means needs attention. So, when you see a bunch of foam or bubbles on the top of water, no matter if it's the ocean, a river, your aquarium, it means something's going on. Now, at the case of an ocean or maybe a river, like a river, usually it's runoff from a farm and there's a lot of kind of manure and that kind of stuff and it's going to cause it to foam, right? That could be bad. Uh, but in our aquarium, typically it's one of a couple of causes and that would be, one would be meds. Meds are a very common one. Things like Prozyquentinol, Prozypro, um, Melifix, Pemafix. There's a few other that will, they tend to foam up and because they cause a different... Uh, viscosity of the water basically as we add soap to water we get bubbles right kind of the same thing some of these medicines change the properties of water and uh, especially of an air stone make a lot of bubbles and they don't pop nearly as fast as water that didn't have that so that is one thing that I can look at in my own store instantly I know like hey what's going on over there do we have sick fish are we treating that what's going on uh, but if you don't have that, a lot of times it could mean you have excess ammonia. Ammonia will also do that. There's a lot of ammonia in the water. You'll see this frothing or the bubbles, kind of like we uh, talked about on a river where there's runoff from a cattle field or something like that. So if you're seeing that in a goldfish tank, which are high urea producers, or maybe sometimes on a pond outside, if you had a small pond, a lot of leaves are going in, you got just a lot of rot going on and that ammonia is spiking, uh, and you've got an air stone going, you'll see that. Without an air stone... Usually you won't see the foam that much. Maybe you'd have a hang on back doing it a little bit, but uh, not a ton. It's really that air stone. And so that's one another reason I like air stones quite a bit is they help bring some of that stuff to light. And there's a lot of stuff we're going to talk about tonight. I've got a list. I did a little bit of planning and uh, of things that when I see, then I know, right? And that just comes from looking at hundreds of fish tanks for over 10 years. At this point in my career, I've had somewhere between one and 300 aquariums in my care for the last 10 years all at the same time. So you tend to learn quickly and you learn repeating patterns a lot faster than if you only had five tanks or 10 tanks, something like that. So, all right. So I've got a little list. Let me pull that up. Another one, someone was asking about hair algae. So when you see hair algae, what does that mean, Right. So the most common things are going to be an imbalance in your aquarium. If you have hair algae, which is kind of a, a longer algae that looks like hair, right? That's why we call it hair algae. It's going to grow on plants or it's going to grow on decorations. Uh, typically, we have excess of a nutrient. And one of the biggest culprits would be iron. So a lot of times what happens, especially if we're new to planted aquariums, we get this kind of vibe in our mind of like, well, fertilizer's good, more fertilizer's better, you know? So like with Easy Green, our own Easy Green, it has some iron in it, but it doesn't have a ton of iron. One, because we don't want to create a lot of algae. Two, because we can't physically get that into the mix. So a lot of people will buy the Easy Iron to go along with it, but then they start dosing both in an aquarium that doesn't really need that excess iron or you've got like a well at your home or just a water source that has a lot of iron in it. And that can get us into our own problems of, we didn't know we had a bunch of iron. Now we're adding more iron to it. And one of the quick and easy ways to spot that would be, wow, I've got hair algae all the time going on. And so the most typical culprit is excess fertilizer, especially iron. Um, you can get that even from, you know, Seachem Flourish. It's going to have some iron in it. There's, most fertilizers will have iron, some in it. And, uh, but excess iron specifically makes a lot of algae. And, uh, so yeah, you got to watch out for that. That's a real visual, easy sign. The other thing I want to talk about is there's a lot of people. And I, I say a lot of people because these are the people that we email with or we talk to in person or, you know, we're interacting with you in some way, whether it's at a show or online. 
But one common theme I see is when someone t is testing their water, let's say every two weeks or every week, they feel like they're safe, right? So the problem with that is that we test the same parameters every week. We're pretty much testing ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, pH, maybe hardness, and not too much after those five, right? So we get into this false sense of security. So for instance, I always like to use analogies, and it would be like me stepping on the scale every morning and going, hey, I haven't gained weight. Okay, we're doing all right. The reality is that's not a good metric on how healthy I actually am or whether, you know, cancer's developing in me or if I'm getting a, uh, you know, diabetes or I'm going to get the flu or it, it really has no bearing. But because we are watching something and it's not getting worse, we assume that everything else is in line with that. And what happens a lot of times with Aquarius is we're watching those parameters by testing and we're not really looking at phosphate, we're not looking at iron, we're not looking at... Uh, CO2 buildup, we're not looking at lack of oxygen, and a lot of times we're not giving a close eye to maybe diseases, aggression, all these other things, because we basically go like, oh, it says here our stuff's good. We're not spending the time to make sure it is good. You know, so that's what I kind of want to reiterate here with all these things we're going to talk about is these are all things that we can see if we're spending time, right? So the best analogy I think I've ever used for something like this is a lot of times we will know like our dog or our cat is sick or something's wrong with it and that's how we know to take it to the vet, right? They're like, huh, didn't eat today or ah, it's, it's being, you know, like it doesn't want to be around us or it's hiding or you, you notice something's off and that's because like with us, our dogs sleep in our bed. We're so close to those dogs every single day of our lives that when something is off, we notice it. And with our aquariums, uh, we should be able to do that as well. But if we take the dog to the vet, right? So imagine this scenario, and it's totally plausible. Take the dog to the vet for a checkup on Monday. Vet checks it out. Looks good. By Thursday, the dog's having you know heart problems or something. But we go, ah, just went to the you know, just went to the, the vet and so now nah, this dog is fine. The reality is going to the vet or checking our water parameters has literally no bearing on whether that dog's going to have a heart attack or that heater's going to fail or we overfed or we contaminated the tank. Like it just, in our minds, yes, it does have that correlation, but in practice it doesn't really relate, you know, because just because we test our water and it's great on Monday doesn't mean we haven't really screwed it up by Wednesday, right? We, most times it hasn't happened, but it's not a good substitute for all these other things we can be visually checking and spending time on. And it doesn't take a long time. And once you see some of these things, you'll know. Like for instance, someone was asking about blue-green algae. Blue-green algae, there are some visual things there, but for me, 100%, I can smell it about two weeks before you'll ever see it in an aquarium. It has a very, very distinct smell. Anyone that's had a big blue-green algae outbreak in their aquarium, you go, yeah, that, that's not normal. Like, what is that smell? Yep, okay. And you'll forever remember that smell. And then the, the key is, once you've had that happen, again, managing hundreds of tanks over 10 years, you'll start to notice, hey, that one time when I smelled that again, like two weeks later, it got the algae. And then once I learned that once, I was able to repeat that always, right? So that smell, once you learn it, and you could learn this from another Aquarius, you could learn it a story, you could be that weirdo of like, hey, there's blue-green algae in there. Oh, that's what it smells like, right? You could learn that, and then you know if you ever smell that smell going forward, you know that you could kind of nip it in the bud and maybe treat it. So... Blue-green algae is actually a bacteria, and it has a smell to it, and it could be black or blue or green, and it kind of coats things. Think of it like you took some bubble gum, and you stretched it out a bunch, and then you just put that like over a plant and some gravel and some rock, right? It kind of is like this webby stuff. That's kind of how it grows. At the very beginning, it just looks like a little bit of green algae. But then it eventually coats stuff, gets pretty thick. You can even see it kind of purling sometimes with getting some bubbles on it. 
uh, if it let it go for a long time. It typically will suffocate out plants just by uh, denying them photosynthesis. And it does like to collect light. So one of the methods to help fight it off is to turn off lighting. That being said, that also is detrimental to plants and it could cause uh, spats between fish and that kind of stuff. The best method to treat it I've found is erythromycin, which is an antibiotic. And yeah, that's that's kind of where I go to treat it. But I notice it's it's developing in the 800 gallon right now. Now, I never smelt it because I don't smell my 800 gallon aquarium it's too high I can't get up there and put my nose under the thing and I don't get underneath very often and smell the sump so I didn't smell it coming on but I was able to identify it yesterday and it's because my gravel or not my gravel but my like very coarse sand or very fine gravel um, it's got a layer of like brown diatom algae growing on it and I was like, you know, that's a sign that this isn't going to be healthy long term. And what do I mean by that? So by viewing that algae on the top, I started thinking about, well, what happened? I took out all these clown loaches. I took out the giraffe catfish, all the things that were hunting through the gravel and turning it all the time. Took all those out. So now we've got this stagnant layer of gravel going on, which is collecting some debris. It's always getting light. It's never getting turned, right? So the the gravel that's up here, never's at the bottom, always get the same amount of light. So we need to get some, probably some, um, something in there to turn that substrate. But I also know that now that blue green algae has developed, we need to combat that. So I might end up using a little bit of erythromycin. It's right on that edge right now. So if I get something in there that will kind of dig it up, I might be able to thwart it. Otherwise, I'm going to have to hit it with a round of erythromycin, and that will get it, and I treat that. I basically put in one dose, and I'll let that sit for an entire week, and it's not a very strong bacteria, or at least I find that erythromycin is very, 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 very effective against it, and so getting it early, much easier. If you wait till it's like really layered up and thick, it might take a few treatments to, um, to get a hold of that, so, but yes, those visual signs are one of the best ways. So even though there's no test kit that exists to test, am I gonna get blue-green algae, there's a smell associated with it, there's a look associated with it, and you can kind of see it coming on. And some of the ways to help prevent it, even though we don't know exactly what causes it, lots of money is being spent, a lot of scientists working on it, we still don't know, there's theories, they've been proven, they've been disproven, but uh, improving uh, general aquarium conditions. And what I mean by that is, you know, just doing maintenance, making sure filters are relatively clean, making sure uh, we've got good flow in the aquarium. In this aquarium, it happens to be um, that it's going to be some fish digging around. That's going to help stir that sand bed up and things like that. Someone asked if there's a common name for that medicine. So the scientific name, erythromycin, uh, two companies currently produce it that I'm aware of that us as hobbyists can buy. That would be API, which they make it as API erythromycin, and Fritz. Fritz makes it, and they call it Maricin. And uh, currently I recommend buying the Maricin because it is a slightly better deal than the API erythromycin. So same active ingredient, but one you're saving a little bit of money on. So that's, that's my advice there. Uh, let's move on to... Let's see here, fish aren't eating. What does that mean to me? So if, if I go to feed a fish and they don't eat and they ate the day before and they, you know, they've, they've never missed a meal except for today, like that should be a sign. It's not like, you know, I just wasn't hungry. Like, yeah, kind of like your dog. Your dog doesn't really just do, ah, just not hungry today. Like animals want to eat every day on a schedule. You know that, uh, you know, we feed our dogs at five o'clock. At 4.30, they're doing the dinner dance already. Like clockwork, you can set a clock to them knowing fish are the same way, right? So when they don't eat, that should be a clue of, hold on, what's going on? What, I got to start looking at stuff, right? That's what it should mean to you. One of the first things I recommend is examine the food, right? So the first thing... Um, if a dog wasn't eating, let's make sure we're not feeding them spoiled food or did we do something different? Is it a different food, right? So 
it's very common for us in the aquarium hobby to be to be uh, not selling, but to be feeding expired food. And what I mean by that is once we open a package of food, which I never open packages of food in here because I never feed fish, there's no fish in here. But once this package of food is open, the clock starts. Think of like this flake food. I'm just going to use these analogies to make this easy, right? The minute I take the top off of this, it's like opening a bag of chips, right? We've got flake food, we've got chips. You open that bag. How long do you think you can feed those chips or eat those chips before they go stale? Maybe a couple of weeks if you're, you know, putting the top back on and keeping it good. Maybe a couple of weeks, right? Now imagine that we have all these fish oils and that type of thing that can go rancid. Like, oh, geez. Okay, we should be putting that in the fridge, really? Right? We might only get a week out of that. And we're doing that continually with our fish. Too often, I don't really have an example here, but okay, this might be a, a decent one. Too often, people will buy the giant bag going, well, this will last my fish six months, and it's a better deal than the smaller bag. I don't have a smaller bag in here, but if I did, I'd use that as an example. And the problem is, every day as I open this up, right, I'm letting in new oxygen, grabbing some food, feeding the fish, right? Then I seal it back up. Every day we're losing nutrients out of here. And in extreme cases, we can actually get funguses, bacteria, uh, the, the oil is going rancid. Yes, there's preservatives, but at a certain point, we push past that, right? We put preservatives in our food all the time. We can push way past that. So one of the, the first things I look at when a fish isn't eating is, hold on a second, how long have I had this food? You know, and so if it's been, in my opinion, this is my own personal rule that I like to live by, you know, manufacturers will tell you different, different fish store will tell you different you know, and realize, take this with a grain of salt of, I'm a guy that sells fish food, but in my personal opinion, in a perfect world, all foods would be used up within one month of opening them. Now, if you use it up in a week, that's even better, but I'm a realist here, and I get that, like, well, I only have two aquariums, no package of fish food can I use up in a week or two. Like, I get it. Like, I totally get that, and so I think about... A month is a good loose baseline rule for most foods. Now, there are foods that do help you, like this one I'm seeing right here, the Sarah Onip tabs. In the 24 count, they come in this metal package. Each one you can feed separately and it doesn't compromise any of the other ones. So that might make sense for you. Whereas like I, I buy them in the Gigantatron size because I feed so many at a time that would not make sense, even though you're like, wait, but they're way cheaper per unit when I buy a billion at a time. They'll all go bad before you ever feed them out if you only have one or two tanks. So sometimes it makes more sense to spend more money, right? Like the Costco effect. If I'm only going to eat, let's say in a month, my family uses this much mayonnaise, maybe I shouldn't buy a 55-gallon barrel of mayonnaise. Like maybe, even though it's, the same price, like maybe I don't need that, right? Uh, so, so people are talking about some frozen fish foods and I was gonna transition to that next anyway. So again, we have a fish that's not eating, maybe they're not eating frozen bloodworms. One of the most likely cases with that is you're feeding your bloodworms and one day you just kinda, you set them down on the counter, you went and fed and then the dog got out and you did a thing and pretty soon you came back and it's been 22 minutes and they're half thawed, or maybe even more than half thawed. We don't really think about it. We take that metal package, we put it back in the freezer, but now we're constantly refreezing that, and we can get a lot of spoilage going on there. So we definitely, with a frozen food, we really want to make sure it's staying frozen, we're not thawing it. Just like we wouldn't want to take chicken, right? If we went and bought chicken at the store, put it in the freezer. We wouldn't want to take it out, let it thaw till it's basically thaw it out, then put it back in the freezer. And then the next day, like, ah, thaw it out again. We Maybe we'll eat it today. Now nah, put it back in the freezer. Like, we're doing that continually with our frozen foods. And so we want to be mindful, like, in a perfect world, you take your frozen foods out right at the freezer, and you put the package right back in instead of, like, taking it to the tank, and you're like, oh, I put it in the tank. Oh, this is making a sound. Hold on. And then you set it. A lot of times people set it on top of their aquarium light or the top of the hood, the warmest spot. And so you'll get a lot of melting going on while you're going, hey, the canister filter's making a sound. What's going on down here? Or, oh, look, that fish looks like he's got a, a bulging eye. You're spending all this time 
not realizing you're passively cooking that frozen food. So these are all signs. One of the things why your fish might not be eating is food that is expired, gone bad. Maybe we got it to go bad without realizing it, but that's one of the first things. If a pet isn't eating, let's make sure the food we are offering is palatable to them and they would want to eat it, right? Uh, the next thing we would look for, I personally would look for, is aggression. So African cichlids, uh, epistogrammas, angels, anything with kind of a little bit of an attitude to it, it's very common for them to shun a fish, right? And so you might be feeding and everyone's frenzying, but, you know, Larry in the corner is not eating anymore. And it might be because every time he comes out, he gets chased. So if I knew the food was good, I would look towards an aggression issue. Like, is there, A, am I keeping fish that might show aggression? B, do I see any aggression? C, did I get food back to that fish? If that fish, you know, is here and the food lands right in front of it, still doesn't want to eat, and all the other fish on the other side of the tank, probably not an aggression thing right there. Still could be, but probably not. So I would look to aggression next, right? Then I would look towards environmental factors. Is it warm enough, right? Is the pH okay? Is there any bubbles? Like, do we have ammonia? Or could it be a med in the water? Like, what could be going on here? And the reality is, there are a lot of things that could be put Larry in the corner. Uh, some of the ones I wrote down real quickly that I've talked about with people and on the live streams in the past would be uh, shadows. So if we're making a shadow on the aquarium because we're backlit, we've got light behind us, maybe overhead lighting in the ceiling, and uh, you're feeding your fish and you create a shadow on the tank, sometimes we're scaring them. Uh, sometimes it might be we got a new TV and that new TV is louder or it's projecting its light more and it's basically causing strobing effects at the tank. Sometimes that, a subtle change, right? Could be time of year. I got the fish during winter, it's been dark outside, it's been fine, but now that we're in spring or summer, there's a lot of light coming through that window and it's casting shadows, right? Could also be a lighting thing in general, right? Maybe we have clown loaches or catfish that would much rather have subdued lighting. So subdued means lower light and they don't want to come out and eat until the lighting is lower. So we might have plecos doing that and might be, oh, because I moved decorations or plants in the aquarium, now where the food lands is much brighter than it was a week ago, right? So we can be doing all these things that we don't think have a big effect, but actually could have very big effects. So, yeah. Someone saying no video? I show video. I think we're good. I'm going I'm to keep going. No one puts Larry in the corner? That's right. Uh, so some other things that can cause some stress uh, would be electrical currents. Now, this is one that's not talked about very often. It's not super likely either. Right? So that's why it's not talked about a lot, but I have run into it probably 10 times, you know, not even once a year, but maybe like four times in the span of five years and then like nothing for a couple of years and then like, oh yeah, there was a, a few times again. But what that means is usually it's a heater, heaters is the most likely culprit, and then power heads. Those are the two that I found to be legitimate stray current producers. And what that means is we put an electronic device in water and then there's a little bit of current. Maybe there's a little bit of short in the cord or maybe a little bit of water is getting to it or the heaters become cracked a little bit or the seals given way and now it's making uh, some current. And you'll get that little buzz sometimes when it's, when it's a lot of current. You'll get the buzz when you put your hand in or you can feel the hair on your arm standing up. But we get a lot of currents in our water, electrical stray current in our water that we can't even detect. But the fish can be very sensitive to that. Another sign, if you had that going on, you can get hole in the head disease or lateral line erosion. Both of those sometimes can be symptoms of stray currents. And it's much more prevalent in the saltwater world where maybe your corals aren't opening up as much. You could have some stray current there. Um, but in freshwater aquariums, sometimes fish not eating or being a little bit more reserved can be a sign or getting kind of mopey. And you can test that with uh, a multimeter you can also buy these things called, um, is it just a, a probe? It's not a probe. Maybe it is a probe. Like they used to make these probes that you basically would plug in and it would, it was just a ground, a grounding probe. My brain couldn't get there, but grounding probe is what I meant. 
uh, and you can get those for your aquarium and you can take out that stray current if there is any, but that's another thing that like, you know, I've tested my water, my water's fine, man, my fish should be okay. Like there's all these things we're actually not testing for all the time that while each one might only have 5% chance of being likely, if there's 20 different things, like that's a lot of chances for something to go wrong. You know, we're covering five of them with our test kit, but if we're missing another 10, we're not looking at majority of the things that could be going on. So I know there's other reasons for fish not to eat, but those are the ones that I can think of off the top of my head besides if you had African cichlids or some mouth brooding cichlids or mouth brooding bettas, they wouldn't eat if they were holding fry themselves. So there's all these little things, but in general, fish isn't eating. Start with, am I actually giving them good food that's not spoiled and it's ready to go? Is there no fish preventing them from eating? Is there anything physically wrong with that fish? Is there anything to be going on with my water? Usually all of these are little guessing games of like, just keep going down the list. Like given a choice, I'm going to eat a taco. If I'm turning down tacos, you start asking questions. Why did you already eat? Do you not like that taco? Oh, is it too hot for you? Is it too cold? Like what's wrong? Right? You like, what's wrong? You like tacos. You should be eating tacos. We need to play that same game with our fish. So, all right. What am I move on to next? Um, Someone earlier was asking about oxygen or I've got something written down about that. So red gills on a fish or gasping at the top of the water. To me, most times that's going to be oxygen deprivation, which means we don't have enough oxygen in the water, which isn't a super likely scenario. So what I mean by that is like nine times out of 10, it's not that we don't have enough oxygen. One out of 10 times, it actually is true, right? But being one out of 10 people, so one out of 10 people that will say like, oh, my fish is at the top of the water. I know one out of 10 of them legit won't have enough oxygen. Nine out of the other 10, they could have gill flukes going on, could just be a fish being weird, could be ammonia, or they got ammonia burn. That's very common when fish get shipped. Ammonia builds up in the bag, burns their gills, and it basically... Like what happens when a fish gets ammonia burn? And this is a very simplistic, um, very simplistic look at this. So I realize it's more complicated than this, but think of like ammonia burns in a bag or even in a tank is like someone smoking for a long time. Their lung capacity just goes down. It's not that they can't breathe anymore. It's that when you got to go walk to the top of the hill, they're huffing, they're puffing because their lungs have to work harder to get the same amount of oxygen. And that's what happens when we burn gills on fish. When they get really red and inflamed, they're showing that they have received some damage and just the way at which they function, they've got all these little like, I don't know, like almost little fingers on the, this is getting te more technical than I know. I know when I look at a slide, I know what they are, but I can't remember the names. Basically, you've got like, part of a, a gill that comes down and they've got all these little fingers that come out and these fingers, once they get damaged, those were the things that actually brought in the oxygen and did the transfer, right? And so once we start damaging those, we limit how, or we're limiting how much comes in for the amount of effort being spent. And so that's what goes on. When you have a fish up gasping, usually it's from ammonia burn or there's not enough oxygen there. So the same amount of work they were doing is no longer giving them the amount of oxygen they need could also be a stress thing if it got really hot in there. When we elevate temperatures, it's not so much that the water doesn't hold as much oxygen. That is a true statement. It doesn't hold as much. But the difference between like, I'm going to use this Diet Coke. So the water at 78, let's say it can hold a full can. The water at 90 degrees holds one ounce less. So it is less, but it's so little less that it's almost irrelevant and this is from my own personal testing uh so it holds a lot of oxygen still it doesn't go down that dramatic now if it was at 200 degrees sure but all our fish are dead but in the range at which our fish live the difference in oxygen is so small that it's usually not a temperature thing that being said here's where temperature does play a big part by getting it really hot we speed up the metabolism. We, the fish might be hyperventilating and that itself is stressful and using, they're using up energy and needing more oxygen, right? So it's kind of like someone who's 
you know, really freaking out. They need more oxygen. They need to sit down and they need to take deep breaths and breathe. And if you have a little bit of less oxygen in the water and they're extra exerted, you know, they're really hot and they're hiking to the top of that mountain, they really need to sit down and make sure they get a lot of oxygen. Now we can compound that by having meds in the water where that's, you know, like Pemafix and Melafix, they'll actually coat some gills on bettas and that kind of stuff. It can actually be harmful to them. So there's all these things, right, that can come into play. And that's what we need to be looking for. Fish gasping, let's look at ammonia, let's look at oxygen, let's try and examine, yes, could it be gill flukes? Yes, but that usually takes a gill clipping or something like that to really identify, did they get ammonia burned? Are they new to you? You gotta play a detective of like, why today and why now are they doing this and they weren't doing it before? It's either because they were new or we've had an environmental change in that aquarium most likely. There's very few fish that will really like dig into um, gills and that kind of stuff. So usually it's not an injury from a fish fight or something like that. It can be, uh, but it, parasite, ammonia, oxygen. So yeah. Someone says, don't forget to hit the like button. That's right, hit that like button if you're enjoying. And it seemed to work last year so, or last year, last week, it's been a long week. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, I'm gonna guilt trip you into subscribing because still 65% of people that will ever watch what the Aquarium Co-op does has never subscribed. And that number doesn't actually matter because you guys watching is what matters. But when it comes time to deal with big corporations like you know Fluval and that kind of stuff, they only see the amount of subscribers. That's all they look at. And so if I have one subscriber, even though we have a thousand people watching, right? We've got, looks like uh, almost 1200 people watching right now. They will never know that. They're never gonna sit on a live stream. They'll never know anything. They're just gonna go, hey, Corey, you're at, looks like 296,000. That's the number they watch to uh, give worth. And so unfortunately, it's not how good of a presenter I am or the information I convey. It literally is a numbers game to these companies. And so. That's where I do this subtle ask. I hope it's a subtle ask of like, if you've been watching for a year or even a couple months and you've never made a YouTube account, it does matter. Even if you never log back in, which actually it's better if you log in because I want you to leave comments and you know converse with us and do all that. But it does matter for you to go, yep, I do like Aquarium Co-op. That's one more person saying, I believe in what they're doing type of deal. So you know, if you don't, you don't, but you're probably not in this chat if you don't believe in what we're doing. Uh, so yeah, that's my, my intermission to get a drink and keep up with, if you see this, do this. All right, the next one we're gonna talk about is your water being cloudy. So you turn on the light, you look in, and you're going, hey, something's different, right? And usually it's just gonna look a little bit foggy. That's the best way I can describe it, it's foggy. Now, we're gonna get a little bit down the rabbit hole and talk about, well, is it green foggy or white foggy or is it like chunky foggy? Like there's, there's all these little subtleties to it, right? So first, you gotta take a look. Look at the fish. Are they doing okay? All right. Then we can move on to looking at the water. Now, the best way I like to look at water is get yourself a white container. Like one of the best ways, and this, this by the way, should be, I should do a video on this. The, this thing is going nuts over here. All right, got another like apparently, <laughs> okay. Um, one of my favorite tools for an aquarium is sour cream containers, like the 16 ounce sour cream containers because they're white and that's important. So when you see cloudy water, we wanna get a clean, um, you know, a clean, sour cream container and get a scoop of water, right? Now what we wanna do is we wanna look down on it and because it's now only this thick and it's white, we can see, is the water green at all, all right? If it doesn't look green, then we know, okay, it's probably not a green water bloom. We'll talk about that. If it just looks clear, it probably is a bacterial bloom because that doesn't add a whole lot of fog to the water and it looks mostly white. And with a white container with white fog, it kinda looks clear. We look in there and we see a bunch of um, a bunch of little like floaty specks. 
Then we know that's the chunky water. That means we've got particles in the water that we need to physically get out, right? So we're gonna tackle each one of those. With the green water, it'll be very apparent in that white container of like, oh yeah, it looks a little green. Then we know we've got free floating algae spores in the water and as time goes on, that'll just get more and more and more green until you get, you know, pea soup green water, right? Uh, it's the color green of all of our members, which thank you to the new members, Duke City Aquariums. Um, I can't pronounce this. It's like Anjanette Warbolowski and Jeffrey Gallagher and all the other, Pat not Patreons, but members we have. Thank you very much. But you've got this green water and it gets greener and greener and greener. And there's a couple of ways you can deny it light. But if you have plants, you're denying your plants. The best method, in my opinion, would be to be a UV sterilizer that uh, basically changes the, the algae so it can't reproduce a little bit. Technically, you could probably water change through it. I've never been able to do it myself. The other way, which I don't mention very often, would be a diatomaceous earth filter. And, uh, but they're kind of out of fashion at the moment, so you probably couldn't even walk into a fish store and buy one. But well, we take care of that. That green water is beneficial to fish. I actually have two tanks full of green water. I'm gonna do a couple of videos about them. Uh, but very good for raising fish, not so good for looking at, right? So that would be the green water scenario. Let's say it's not that though. You're going, ah, doesn't look green, Corey. All right, let's say it looks clear, right? Just looks clear, doesn't look like anything's floating in it. You probably have a bacterial bloom going on. Now we call it a bloom, because it's blooming, so it's making more, right? So one, something has happened in this aquarium. Something has happened that the bacteria that's there goes, hey, we don't have enough, we need more, okay? So that might mean we did a big clean yesterday and we killed some bacteria because we cleaned the filter, we cleaned the glass, we gravel vacked, we did all the things, right? Could mean we fed a bunch of food yesterday more than we normally would and now the bacteria is going, hey, I can't keep up. I need more helpers. Could be that we had a fish die back in the corner and we didn't see it and now it's rotting, making ammonia and that kind of stuff, right? Again, bacteria is going, hey, we need more helpers. So we get this bloom. So all the bacteria you have on rocks and glass and the filter, it blooms. And when it blooms, it goes into the water and we get this foggy look to it. Now that'll eventually settle down onto surfaces and help us and there's not a lot we should be doing other than uh, making sure that we didn't have that dead fish. We don't have ammonia from overfeeding the day before, all that type of thing. Like as, as long as everything else checks out right, all right, well, it'll settle back down. And we can get it sometimes we add way too many fish at one time. Could be we the heater broke and got way too hot and killed some bacteria. Could be a medicine killed some bacteria. But it basically means the bacteria knows it needs more bacteria. Whether we killed some or whether we just need more, that we're going to have to investigate, right? But if we just typically do nothing, assuming everything else is healthy, it will settle down and we'll be better for it. All right. So then we've got the chunky water. And it's not, you know, physically chunky, but you can see debris in it. Like when you look at it, you go, there's stuff in this water. Now that, we have to get out of the water. And... So a couple of ways, if it's really chunky, like let's say you had your Jack Dempsey finally decided he hates Java Fern and he's just pulled it all apart or he killed your, your plastic plant, you can use like a big old net. Just get in there and keep doing this move and eventually you collect all these particles, you can throw it out, right? Uh, but if it's something finer, we're gonna have to use like quilt batting or sponge. I don't have any of that because I'm bad at my job, but you, you could use something that is fine and it'll get clogged in there, right? So we want to be careful though. Someone's talking about clogged filters. We don't want it to get so clogged that it, it chokes off the filter. So if it's the morning, you turn your light on, you're going, hey, it's foggy. Oh, there's all these particles in it. Maybe you put a piece of uh, fine floss in there, but by lunchtime, go ahead and check in on it and go, oh, that's getting clogged up. Let me throw that out, put another piece in. And what you're doing is you're just collecting all those particles. Think of it like it's kind of a vacuum. We're just sucking it all up and we're going to throw it out. We're going to keep doing that until there's no more left in there, right? 
uh, that's that's the chunky water scenario. It's pretty much always one of those three uh, that is going to be the culprit on this water doesn't look clear in terms of fogginess. Now, I hate how everything I talk about, I can think of like five more things like, well, okay, technically there's also tannins. Water can get tannins from wood and that kind of stuff. I've got that going on in the 800 gallon basically as wood is rotting and breaking down it's releasing the brown tannins like we're making tea into the water we can water change that out we can use carbon to change that or not change that but absorb that uh, that being said that's not really really detrimental and it's pretty easy to diagnose oh put a giant piece of wood in yesterday today i have brown water i know what happened right it's not really a mystery unless you've never done it before you've never heard of it so yeah all right uh, now we're going to switch gears because there's still, you know, different allergies to talk about, different illnesses, all that kind of stuff. We're going to switch gears to uh, something more basic, and that is water. So there's water outside of your aquarium. This one happens a lot. Whether you own 100 tanks or whether you just have owned tanks for 10 years, eventually someone is going to say, hey, did you know there's water outside your aquarium? And then you have to diagnose it, right? So either you are going to diagnose it or you're out of town and you got to be like, oh, uh, well, look here, look here, look here, look here. These are the ones that I've found to be some of the most common sources. So one of them would be water wicking. Now, what does that mean? That means that water is going from inside your aquarium, outside your aquarium, being wicked out by something and wicking means like if you put a towel inside your aquarium like let's say you're like oh I need to dry my towel because I used it all day long and you put it in the lid right and you want it to dry there so when you come back tomorrow and you're gonna work on your aquarium it's dry well if that towel touches the water it's gonna wick up that towel and outside down on the floor you're gonna have all this water this dripping you're going to have a pool of water down on the floor, and you're going to wonder, what's going on? Oh, it wicked out of there, right? That's how wicking works. That being said, we get wicking in other ways. So another way would be a tank with a black trim all the way around it. There's a bead of silicone in there that seals it. Well, when that gets old, when we fill the water level up and it touches that trim, it can do that same wicking effect, and you can get drips of water coming out of your aquarium. And that will make us think like, oh, our tank is leaking, it's cracked, something's going on, right? So those are two things to look for right away is like, do I have a way I'm wicking water out right here? And one of the ways to test if it's your trim is make sure the water level is lower than the trim. If your trim is right here, put the water level down to here. If no water is outside anymore, and then you fill it back up, oh, and you start getting water outside, guess what? We figured it out. We can repair that or just keep the water level down. Now... Other things we might look for, we want to check on uh, check valves, right? So maybe any air pumps or CO2 we have going. When it loses power, stuff's going to back siphon into that. If the check valve is compromised, that could allow water to leak out through a regulator or a air pump. So check those real quick. Obviously, I shouldn't say obvious because not everything's always obvious, but uh, likely... If there's water happening from that, it's going to be really close to that device. Oh, my air pump is wet. That's a good sign, right? That, oh, it's probably that check valve. Or maybe you didn't even have check valves installed. Uh, same thing with the CO2 regulator. The next thing I like to check is uh, O-rings. So that could be on your hang-on back, could be on a bulkhead because you have a sump, could be on canister filters, right? Anywhere we're using a piece of uh, rubber to create a seal so that water can't escape those will wear eventually because most of us as aquarists are really bad about servicing them with silicone lube uh, to make sure they don't crack right so because we're bad at that or we don't even know we didn't even know our hang on back had at least one o-ring that needs to be serviced over time a leak will just develop and the way i like to diagnose that is if i can't see some of those first options we talked about I like to get paper towels, and I like paper towel for a reason. I'll explain that. Uh, I like to get paper towels and wipe down everything that's wet on the outside of an aquarium. Everything, everywhere. And I use paper towels so that once they get saturated with water, I get a new paper towel. If you use a, uh, a towel 
that towel gets wet and then you're just moving water around and you're leaving water droplets everywhere. We need this to be super duper duper dry. And so we get paper towels starting to get wet, get a new paper towel. Make sure you can run that thing all the way around everything and it comes out super dry. Then give yourself, you know, an hour or two, something like that, and then go back with a dry paper towel and start feeling all the filters and all that kind of stuff. And the minute it gets wet, you know it's that device, right? Because sometimes, and this is just for me doing this a billion times, you're reaching around and then you like gets on your hand, you're like, wait a second, is that wet? Like it's so little bit of water, you're like, is that wet or am I crazy? Am I just super paranoid right now or is that wet? The paper towel will never lie. Like you'll look at it and you will legit see like, oh, it's wet or it's not at all, right? There's no question with doing that. So uh, I like to use a paper towel for that reason. It's very good at yes or no answering that question for you. And yeah, so those are the most likely things. And then it comes down to maybe your aquarium actually is leaking, the silicone has a problem. Like there are some other things, but all those other scenarios, super duper way more likely than your aquarium actually leaking. So start there. If you just start with, oh God, my tank's leaking, what am I gonna do? Like that is the least likely scenario. It's much more likely that one of the other gadgets has just started to leak and we could fix it, right? So, all right, what else we got? Aquapros is going pond season number two. AKA, he's gonna make a lot of videos about digging. Anyway, uh, Blackbeard algae, let's talk about that. So Blackbeard algae, what is that? You see that growing? And then what does that mean, right? That's what we're trying to do in this video. So when you see it growing, it's gonna mean one of 12 things. No, a few things. <laughs> Snow M6, how's it going? Your friends, be jealous. Anyway. Usually what that's going to mean is either A, we brought in something that was contaminated, right? So what I mean by contaminated is another aquarium had it growing on a decoration. We put that decoration in our aquarium. We transferred it. It's not necessarily a bad thing. can be unsightly. can be fun. can be desirable. might mean we bought a plant somewhere. We bought a plant. It came in. It had blackbeard algae. Now we have blackbeard algae because our environment's good enough to grow it and we don't have something eating it, right? But... A lot of times what it'll mean, it'll mean that we are lacking maintenance or flow. And when I say maintenance, that's so many things. Could be water parameters. Could be that we're just not physically cleaning our aquariums. Could, back in the day, it used to mean that we weren't changing out our light bulbs and so the lighting spectrum was changing. Could mean all these things, right? So there's that. Flow is another one, like algae in general just typically likes to get a foothold in the slow areas, right? Kind of in that back alleyway under that piece of wood. You know that place you never look because you can't see over there and it's dark and it's crummy and there's like buildup down there. Yeah, right there is where it likes to get its foothold. So by increasing flow in the aquarium and kind of staying up on our maintenance, that helps most people. Now that being said, you've got people that are putting in 100 hours a day get things clean as a whistle and they're still getting it could be from a contaminated source and whatever is in their waters is lending itself to keep growing and there's also people that will intentionally grow it because it does look super cool when it really carpets out um, but that's what I look at when I see that I go hmm have we been uh, neglecting some of our our maintenance duties or is it a lighting issue or like how you know when someone asks me and they don't want it anymore my thing is how do we get there right you know so I think of it like this. When someone goes like, man, I have a ton of sticker bushes in my backyard. And you go back there and then you go, your, your grass is this tall. Like it's, it's, it's over my knee. When's the last time you mowed this? Like, oh, I mow it once a year. And you're like, yeah, it's that maintenance thing. Like if we kind of mowed every four to six weeks and then you notice that one time when you're over your neighbor's yard, that sticker bush was coming in and you could have just cut that thing off. Yep, that's how we take care of that. Now that it's like, oh, it's this? Yeah, we're going to kind of have to really do a lot more work and kind of nuke it and really fight it. We got to dig it up. We got to do all these things. And so it's kind of easier and better just to be like, well, I just be a little more proactive and then you get the benefits on the other end. So 
Okay, moving on, we're gonna go with film on top of the water for this one. So you might open up your aquarium one day and you see what looks like an oil slick on top of the water. Now this is usually a protein buildup, a protein film. Now where do we get proteins? We get proteins from fish foods. One of the big culprits would be like uh, frozen bloodworms. We get proteins from dead fish, if fish dies and uh, releasing a bunch of stuff. We get that oil, because fish oils, right? What are some of the ways we can combat this? If you have the super duper 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 aquascaped tank that looks dope, that could never have an air stone in it, then we have to do manual removal. And so, like if it's right before a photo shoot, again, paper towel is really good at that. You lay a paper towel on the surface of the water, you pick it back up. Now you don't wanna mix it back in the water because it'll just settle back to the top, right? So you take this paper towel, you lay it on top of the water, then you pick it right back up, and you're gonna notice that all that protein film sticks to the paper towel. You're gonna to throw that out. Then you're gonna take another one, you're gonna to get to the other side, and you're gonna pick that up. You're gonna do that till you get it all, basically, right? As much as you can, because there'll be some behind the filter and that kind of stuff that you can't really get to. And then you're gonna to have to continually do that, unless we build a system to prevent that. One of the things we could do, we could do a surface skimmer, like the little Eheim surface skimmers, because it pulls water into that it's gonna continually uh, mix it back into the water and hopefully our filtration is gonna break that down and pull it out, that's one way. Another way would be an air stone. So again, you notice the theme here, like I'm big on air stones and what the air stone does, it's like I've got one, well, wow, it's still plugged in. Did you guys know this air pump's been running for the last entire week and it's been running this whole time? Doesn't make a whole lot of sound, uh, but as the air gets pumped in and it comes back out and it pops, what happens is, you know, have you ever been sitting next to like a, a soda, right? A freshly poured soda at a restaurant and you're sitting there talking and like some bubbles pop out and you can feel it hit your hand or something like that? That's going on 24-7 in an aquarium that has an air stone. Those bubbles are throwing little bits of water and that kind of stuff out, right? Well, that also happens with that protein film. A bubble goes to the top, it pops, and it's gonna fling some of that protein film outside the aquarium. Now, yes, yeah, so that technically gonna land on your stand, your wall, all that kind of stuff, yes, but we don't even notice it. Like, it, it's, it's such small amounts, it's almost unnoticeable. Uh, so that's one of the great ways to do it is, and you're gonna get, uh, you're gonna get extra oxygen in the water, you get some other benefits, yes. Easy, easy to do there. Now, you can technically set up a filter, like a hang on back to help combat that. You can, you know, do a little bit of, um, aiming your canister return or your circulation pump, that helps a little bit, but it's not nearly as good as that surface skimmer, paper towel method, or a air pump method. So those are the ways I like to combat it. And I do like a permanent solution because I don't want to do that. So I get to correct candy overhauls because I haven't had a chance to talk to her because I was busy all day, but these air pumps actually are back in stock. They arrived back in stock today. So we're lucky. So technically they're back. They should be in inventory if Randy's done his job, which I was told he did. So, uh, let's see here. Next one we're going to go with is a bulging eye. You look into your fish tank, and a fish has got kind of an eye. Not necessarily clouded over anything, but it's kind of bulging a little bit. Now, what that typically means to me is either A, it got in a fight with someone, but if it's just like a tetra, probably not. Uh, or B, it's starting to get a bacterial infection. Now, I would normally end up treating that with erythromycin or maricin, kind of get that going, but I like to look at um, what could cause this, right? So, like, we know how to treat it, okay? So, we're going to fix that, but how did we get here, right? Like, if I trip over a skateboard every morning on the way to work, and yes, I can bandage up my knee because I scrape my knee, but we should still figure out, wait, what's causing me to trip every day? Oh, that skateboard, right? Kind of the same thing. We need to figure out why does this fish have a bulging eye? Is it super stressed out? Or is it getting beat up? Or are nitrates really high? Or is the temperature too hot? Or like there's all these things. Yeah, we're going to look at water parameters. Yes, we're going to look at straight current. Yeah, we're going to look at fish aggression. But that should be the thing. A lot of times we go, oh, Oh, you scraped your knee. Let's put a Band-Aid on that, right? 
but we don't figure out like, oh, you're just going to do that again tomorrow? Oh, so that's what we need to do. Yes, we need to fix that with an antibiotic, but B, we also need to figure out what was causing it and ask yourself a lot of questions and sitting there and thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking. If you can't answer that question, the reality is you don't know the answer yet. You know, if you're just going, huh, don't know. So probably it's going to happen again at some point. Uh, unless, and, you know, rarely is it a fluke. And it can always be a fluke of like, oh, man, actually there's a tumor growing behind this fish's eye, right? It could be cancer. There's all these things that could be, could be they got constipated, could be we fed them, um, could be we fed them bad food and they got constipated and now they're blowing up, they're bringing on a lot of liquid and so their eyes are starting to puff out. Like there's all these things. But if we can't find an answer, we need to keep looking and thinking about like, what could this be? There's got to be like, keep thinking like, oh wait, I didn't think about this yet. Like is the air pump working? Is the food still good? Is the temperature the same? What else did I change? Did I bring in a new fish? Did I, like there's rarely rarely is it like no randomly my eye popped out i was walking down the street i just popped right out no no cause put it right back in never did it again right like it's kind of one of those things like when something like that happens something caused it and then probably we will repeat that at some point like just because that's the way the world works so all right what do we got going on today in the list uh, I think there's only one left. Yeah, okay. I've got one left that I wrote down because I was really crunched for time. And that would be red veins in the fins of a fish. So what does that mean? There's a little bit of red streaks or anything like that going on. And really prevalent in goldfish because they have big fins we get to see. And they typically are clear, which helps us see them. And... It's usually a stress factor. So with goldfish in particular, it's usually heat or ammonia or something like that causing the stress. But when you see stress or the red veins, stress is going on. It could be getting beat up. But that right there, like I saw it going on uh, last night in the goldfish in my living room tank, and I know why. It's because I've got a lot of I've got a lot of duckweed in that tank, and I'll explain why that's going on in a little bit. Uh, but when I saw that, that was a sign that like, okay, I need to get on top of this. I should do a water change. I need to check water parameters. I need to check all these things. I personally know that it's that duckweed causing a problem. So this is like, let me wrap that up. Red veins in fins is caused from stress and we gotta figure out what's causing that stress. So now I'm gonna transition into the second half of the show, I guess, and that is like kind of Q&A and just talking about what's going on with the business and me and all that. So why does Corey have stressed out goldfish in his living room tank? Well, a couple of things. Originally, that goldfish went in there to eat that duckweed. Turns out that goldfish doesn't like to eat duckweed and loves eating the hair algae instead. So it's doing a very good job and making plenty of, plenty of green poops uh, eating that algae, and it's making headway. That being said, the duckweed is growing out of control because we're eating all that algae, turning that into poop, and then it's fueling the duckweed. Normally, I would get in there with a net and take it out, but I ordered myself an oxygen testing kit, much like one that you guys could use instead of using my uh, oxygen meter. I'm going to use a kit, and I want to do a video. I don't know when that's going to come out, but uh, illustrating some of the facts of like having an air stone and having a bunch of floating plants cuts off oxygen transfer and can actually bring your levels down pretty low. And so I need to do that test and video that part before I remove all the duckweed. Otherwise, I got to wait for it all to regrow. And so tonight I'll probably do a water change, remove some of that duckweed just to buy me some time until I can shoot the video. Uh, so that's why my fish has it going on, even though I know uh, that it's not optimal, but I gotta get on it soon. Like I can't just totally ignore. So, all right. Uh, yeah, now I'm gonna talk about new products because we have a new product this week, which is one of the last few um, new products for a while I think it's not revolutionary it's not new like you've never seen one before it would be this right here this white box Ooh, 
Ooh, how do you get a white box? You buy it from the aquarium co-op. Look at that. Ooh, what's in the box? Does it make sounds? Does it make sounds? Um, let me open it up here. Oh, that made like a cool sword sound. Like, shing! It is the Pleco Cave. So we, we scoured the lands, and we got ourselves some Pleco Caves. Now, you may have seen Pleco Caves like this before. That's because there's really not much technology to a Pleco Cave. Like, you kind of make it with an opening at the about five to six inch level, and it's about an inch and a half. This one's actually two and three eighths by an inch and a half. And Plecos, like Bristle Nose, breed in there, and, you know, catfish hang out in it. But what makes ours worth talking about? Nothing. It's, it's a stupid Pleco Cave that everyone needs and we all use. But because we found our own source, instead of buying them from another uh, source, we now brought, we used to sell a cave very much like this for $12.99. Now we sell them for $6.99, a little bit more than half the price. But that's what I've been continually trying to do. Where can I buy products that make sense, that we know we're going to sell, that we can bring the buy price down on and kind of reward you guys for hanging out. You've been around for a long time, many years now. And like, because you buy enough, I can go, I think we had to buy a couple thousand of these, you know, to make it worth our while. We had to order a couple thousand of them, which you start doing that math. You're like, wait a second. That's a lot of money. Yeah, it was. Uh, but I want to kind of show you because I found this box sitting here. So this takes, let me talk about this a little bit. So my, you know, my, my employees are always worried that other people are just going to do this. And I say, like, yes, other people could do this. Our competitors could do this. But they think that because we're bringing out all these new products, people just think this is easy. And I go, well, they might think that, but it's actually a lot of work. So we saw these in China over a year ago. Took a long time and a lot of samples to get them where I have in a white box for you guys to buy. That's, we've got hundreds of hours into this. We've got, I don't know about tens of thousands of dollars, but probably maybe $10,000 into like paying employees to work on this and flying out there and testing and getting samples and doing all that. So let me show you part of that process. Part of that process, like why do you sell this cave, Corey? Well, let me tell you. Because, let me make sure this doesn't have any like crazy... No, that is my store address. Okay, not worried. You gotta you gotta test all the caves, all of them. So we tested this one, right? This is a much bigger cave. So that's one we tested. We tested this one, right? We tested this one. You're going like these look really similar, like they are, but they're all slightly different. And plecos like different things and different openings and different sizes. Then we had this one, and we have this one, and we have this one, and we have this one, which is a different size, by the way. This one's smaller than that one we were showing you earlier. And we have this one, and I think we actually have two or three more. So we end up going through all of these caves, testing them, seeing what the Pleco's like, seeing what we like, seeing, like, oh, this one's a little bit too thin, this one's a little bit, um, you know, so yeah, it, a lot of it goes into it, and I'm not going to pretend like no one else could do it, but I know it's a lot of work, and it just seems like, cool, you got a cave. Cool. Yeah, I get it, guy. You ordered up a cave. But a lot of testing goes into those caves to figure out which is the one we want, which one can we stand behind, what's the right price point, who's making them, are they actually fish safe, you know? Because there's a bunch of places, like, you call up China, which you know no one calls up China, but you call up China, you're like, I need a cave! And 47,000 different companies can make that cave for you, but only seven of them have ever kept a fish tank before. And of that, only three of them are, like, trustworthy to work with. And then of those three, only one of them, like, we can actually communicate with. So it, like, takes a long time to convey what we want and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, we have a new Pleco Cave. By new, I mean we have Pleco Caves that are now just cheaper, and uh, hopefully it saves you guys some money. Yeah. New website looks great. Just visited and I love it. Yep, that was a back back end project I've been working on for quite a while. There's still some more tweaks to go on, still some more optimizations. Uh, but 
I love the right hand menu on the mobile and some other things that I like and some more things to implement too. But I wanted, it was a big enough change that like this is a big enough change in the right direction. Let's get that going before I start doing some traveling and stuff because otherwise you'd be like, oh, it took a year to, uh, you know, get that into play. So, all right, I know there's been some super chats and I'm sure there's been some good questions and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Let me hop over there. Plants, is an air stone like mini CO2 since air as CO2? I've talked about that in the past. Yes, I believe that set up correctly that um, as long as the plants are utilizing the CO2 in your aquarium by bubbling oxygen, not oxygen, I always see, I always get called out when, when 50,000 people watch your video and you make that mistake, like when you bubble in oxygen, then you'll get some CO2. Someone will always chime in and be like, well, actually, if you're bubbling in oxygen, there is no CO2, idiot. And I'm like, okay, I meant to say, when you, when you bubble in air that's around us, there will be some CO2 there, and some of that can diffuse into the water. So yes, is it like adding a very tiny amount of CO2? The answer to that is yes, if the level of CO2 in the water is less than what it can already hold. So like if you didn't have any plants in there and you bubble in oxygen, that won't necessarily, you bubble in air, not oxygen. When you bubble in air, that won't necessarily add more CO2. Otherwise, we'd end up with way too high levels of CO2 in our aquariums and all our fish would die. But if something was already using it and we could dissolve some more back in, yes, that is a very low end way and not nearly as efficient as a actual CO2 system. But yes, I... I firmly believe and been able to document it in my aquariums that it does work that way, yes. Is adding iron, an iron nail, a good source of iron for plants? So that's one that I've never tested well. So have I ever done it? Yes. Did I ever measure it? No, this was way, way back. So way back in the day before we had liquid fertilizer and that kind of stuff, yes, people would do that for their plants. That being said, I have no idea on dosage. I don't know if it's one six inch nail to 600 gallon aquarium or it's one six inch nail to five gallon aquarium. I have zero idea. You're in uncharted territory. I've done it, but I have not done any charting to know this is the ratio you'd want to do or anything like that. So yes, is it a good source? I don't know if I can say it's a good source. Is it a source? Yes, it is a source. I don't know if I can say it's good just because I feel like I need way more testing before I be like, this is good. All right. How can I get plants from you for half the price of my hometown? I can explain that. Uh, say hi to me next time you're in Lakeland, Lakeland, Florida. Is that where that is? Yeah. Uh, it comes down, everything, well, I won't say everything in business. A lot of things in business come down to volume, right? The more you buy, the more you, or the more you sell, the more you can buy. So as an online store, we get better pricing than we used to get when we were just a physical store. Now we sold a lot of plants when we were a physical store as well, compared to most physical stores. But as we buy more, things scale better, right? So here's a perfect example that I was relaying to like Randy, my director of operations. If I buy one box of plants and ask to go on an airplane, it might cost us $100, right? Costs a hundred dollars ship one box of plants. Now, that being said, when you ship two boxes of plants, that might only cost you hundred and five dollars. You go what? Right? Kind of the same thing. If you need to drive across town to pick up a piece of mail, how much more does it cost you if you need to pick up two pieces of mail? Basically, nothing more, right? But if it was like oh, two big boxes, maybe it costs you a little bit more. That's kind of the same way with shipping. So, for instance, today. I picked up 23 boxes of plants, right? That's, that's a lot of plants. Let's, let's be honest. Most boxes were holding at least 200 plants. So, you know, you start doing that math, you're like, wow, that's, that is a lot of plants, right? And so the shipping on that, full transparency, was a little more than $500 for 23 boxes. If we know one box is like 100 bucks, and 23 boxes is like 500 bucks, you can see some of that scale of like, oh, so ch shipping kind of gets cheaper. 
That being said, when you start buying thousands of plants at a time, one would expect you could pay a little bit less, right? And it's not like it's not like I'm paying half of your local store or anything like that. Like I'm just paying a little bit less, but I'm also getting a little bit less shipping, right? So there's all these things that kind of come into play. Then there is what does the profit margin need to be? Now we've leveraged Aquarium Co-op to be our goal is to sell lots of things. And so we run at a lesser margin. So what that means in the business world is your local store could sell a plant for $10. We might sell that same plant for $5. We've got to sell, you would think, two plants to make the same money as they did. The reality is we got to sell three plants because each plant had a cost, right? So if we had to sell two to make $10, well, we had to pay a cost and we had to pay a cost. Your store only had to pay one right? And then, so that's why we have to sell three to make the same money they had to make when they sold one. Now, why would a store ever want to sell something at $10 when their competitor is selling at five? Sometimes things aren't scalable. So let's say you've only got one person that knows anything about plants and they can only work five days a week. Selling more isn't always a good thing if the way let's say the other person sells plants, they're dying and because they don't know how to take care of them. Like, oh yeah, just stick them in the water with your, uh, with your Oscars. They love plants and then they die and you have to credit them back, right? So sometimes you might not be able to scale that part. And so you're better off selling fewer plants and in general, the higher price something is, the more people are willing to learn about it and they're being like, they'll take less risk. So if I made all my plants $1, right, way more people will be like, cool, I'll just take like 20, we'll see what happens. If all my plants are $20 each, no one's kind of doing that. No one's going to go, oh, geez, let's take a risk, right? So you can feather what's going to sell a little bit there. That being said, also, driving to the airport to get one box of plants is the same amount of time for me versus getting 23 boxes, right? So it takes roughly two hours to go pick up plants, bring them back to the store and get back home. That makes a lot more sense at 23 boxes than it does at one box, right? And so at one box, you might be having it shipped to you via post office or FedEx. A lot of stores have that happen. And at one box, the problem you find out is like, wow, it's $170 to ship FedEx that box of plants. It's cheaper to go to the airport, right? But I had to pick up those plants today at noon because they didn't land till 11.30 a.m. And so if I was back at my old retail store and it's just me and one other employee, I might not even be able to go to the airport to pick them up because I don't have anyone to cover. So inherently, again, adding more costs. So it's that whole scale issue of, you know, a lot of that. But then there also is like, oh no, that person's just gouging you. There's always that like, wow, $700 for pizza, huh? Must be real good pizza. There's always that effect too. But I do give a lot of leeway to the mom and pop store. And cause I, I am one, you know, we, we would see those same challenges in the retail store if we didn't have the online. So that's how that scaling issue can come up. And so I like to make sure that I wouldn't view, I never recommend people view I don't want to vilify the local mom and pop store because we are lucky enough to be able to do things now that we weren't able to do when we were a mom and pop shop. That being said, I always like to give the caveat of everyone else can put years into YouTube and hopefully make something successful out of it, build an online business, and then also do what we're doing. So we're not, we haven't done anything that other people can't do. We've just stuck to doing something very long and now it's paid off, right? So yeah, that's how it might be that we can sell a plant cheaper than than your competitor or not your competitor, but your local fish store. So uh, Stephanie Schultz says, hi, Corey, my boyfriend and I love watching your videos. I've got a 75 gallon freshwater planted tank. My nitrates have been staying around 20 to 40 parts per million. Other than water changes, how do I bring it down? Uh, there's a couple of ways. The one I would always recommend is live plants. That's going to be easiest. It looks the best. That's first and foremost. If you have fish that won't allow that, you can look into some pothos or bamboo, something growing out of the top of your aquarium. 
then you get down into anaerobic bacteria, which is bacteria that doesn't need oxygen, actually oxygen, and that will digest nitrates. It takes a little bit to set it up. You need a real deep sand bed or a filter that will get no oxygen into it so it can do that. Um, this bag is right in the camera shot and it's driving me nuts. There, now it's out. Uh, so I recommend some plants of some sort. It could be in a hang on back filter, it could be in the aquarium. You can also do more water changes, um, you know, which you don't wanna do, I, I get that. And so I rely on plants in almost every single one of my aquariums to help be part of that. So what I find a little bit funny is everyone pretty much unanimously agrees. And when I say everyone, let's just say if I ask the next 100 people at a PetSmart, they would all agree. That's the metric here. Does an aquarium need a filter? They would all pretty much say yes, right? Plants are just a filter. So I run all my aquariums. All, all aquariums need some plants because they're going to help digest that nitrates for me. So it becomes something that everyone agrees that you have to have, but doesn't agree you have to have this. In my mind, you just have to have some live plants worked into your system somehow if you don't want to make up with water changes. So, yeah. Uh, let's see here. Aquaclear 20 filters is new, is very noisy. Any fixes? So, you got a brand new Aquaclear 20. We're going to cover the most likely culprits. The lid can vibrate. Try taking that lid off. If the sound is gone when you take the lid off, know that, all right, that lid wasn't set on correctly or something's going on here. Maybe you just live without a lid. Next most likely thing is it's not filled up with water enough, so it's struggling to pull enough water and maybe it's pulling in a little air. That can make it kind of loud. The next thing would be sand or a snail shell or something like that got sucked in and is rattling around where the impeller is. So you might want to take that out and inspect it and make sure to look down in the hole. Make sure you can get a Q-tip down in there and be like, is there anything that could be causing this? Uh, outside of that, then it could come down to like, you got a crazy sensitive ear that no one else has. But, you know, if it's audibly loud, like maybe you post in the aquarium group support or something like that, you take a video and everyone else can go, oh, that's normal or no, that's not normal. Something crazy is going on. But you do that troubleshooting thing and eventually you'll be like, oh, yeah, there was a little thing doing a thing that caused this noise. Because they're not out of, the, out of the gate, so to speak. They're not a noisy filter. Like they're not considered to be loud. There's usually something causing that. All right, Caroline Epler says, recently got some three inch ink fin calvis at an auction. So calvis is a tangenecan cichlid, very slow grower, kind of an ambush predator, kind of in a quesadilla shape so it can get into rock. So that way we kind of know what we're talking about. Maybe you're Googling it as we're talking about right now, calvis. Uh, when I opened the bag, it smelled of death. I plopped her in the 29 gallon with multiple sponge filter. She's doing okay, but she is shy and will she be okay alone? So in general, being an ambush predator, that fish is just shy. They love to be in a cave kind of just looking at you, right? And this is the international sign for being in a cave, two hands like this. And so some people think you're looking into a car window. No, that's this right here. This, you move it out two inches, that's international symbol for cave. So it's in a cave and it just likes to look around and like to stock things. So that's a normal behavior that I've seen from Calvis. Uh, it's smelling like death. Probably spent a long time in a bag. Maybe got handled a bunch of times because it's in an auction, right? And as it's getting picked up each time, it's releasing more urea into the bag. It's scared. We're just scaring it, making it go to the bathroom. And so I do think it'll probably make it through it. Uh, adding some dither fish that it can't eat might help. Uh, but know that it, in general, is a reclusive fish outside of eating time. So, yeah. All right, we made it through the Super Chats. What are we going to talk about now? Hmm, I don't know. Other than encouraging you guys to go hang out on Facebook, I am making more of an effort to hang out there myself because I want to diversify. If YouTube decides they hate me tomorrow, I want to have a bunch of people on Facebook to go as a backup. Not that Facebook is second to this, uh, but I'm going to start doing, like, I might start doing a pre-game show, you know, where it's like 20 minutes before I go live here. Maybe I'll go live on Facebook, you know, just to answer a little bit more Q&A, um, do some more stuff like that, you know. So if you want to see that kind of stuff, hang out there. If you're, you know, if you think uh, Facebook is 
is the devil. I get it. Whatever. You don't have to hang out there. You're not going to miss anything, really. Well, I don't want to say you're not going to miss anything, but, like, it's not like you can't join the club or anything like that. Like, you're just not going to see it all, you know. So, but, you know, so much stuff gets posted for members only. They get posted on Facebook. They get posted on Instagram. They get posted here. Like, if you're not following us everywhere, pretty much, you're missing some stuff. Like, that's just... I I don't believe I personally don't believe in spamming the same thing on every single platform. Maybe two, you know, but it's got to be something really special for me to be like, let me ram it down your throat over here and here and here and here and here and here and here. So, Java Moss on wood anytime soon. Uh, I don't know, Daniel. So the way that works, we order from a farm that doesn't speak English. There's a trans shipper in between that farm and us. And so I can ask my trans shipper, and then they go, well, we'll ask. And then it comes back, and then they say, like, yeah, maybe. So every week we definitely order it. I order, you know, 50 to 100 every single week. We didn't get any last week. I don't know if we got any the week before. Um, I know we didn't get any this week, well, Monday when I picked up. And I ordered it again for next week, so I hope it comes in because we sell it, makes us money. Uh, but... You know, the co-op effect is a very real effect that we are running into more and more every day. As I was talking in the Corvus Oskin live stream, the co-op effect is basically we start buying something and we start selling so much of it. And because we sell it and we show it in videos, other people start selling it. So imagine that we start, you know, this happened with this product, for instance. We like Viberbytes. We feed Viberbytes. Uh, we start showing it in videos. Every store also starts selling it because it was sitting on their shelf. And maybe they didn't you know, know that puffers were eating it and that kind of stuff. And now this video comes out. You're at the store and you go, oh, I should try that. You pull it off the shelf. They're selling more of it, right? So we're selling a ton. Every other store is selling some. And we're all hitting up the wholesalers going, we need more. We need more. Like it's selling, right? And so that's the co-op effect that we have going. And unfortunately, with one of the products that we brought in, like the Nano Twig Packs, I don't have any of that in here, but those stick packs that everyone, I won't say everyone, a lot of people love, uh, and we desperately need more of. I think we're going to run out in like another 12 days, our forecasting software tells us. Uh, is I won't say it's never going to happen again, but it was a product that was, here's what was happening. So, we need to buy, what is this? This is 20 to 30 centimeter spider wood. If we ordered up this and we needed a thousand of these, where they're made, they would go like, oh, it can't be longer than 30 centimeter. Let me start measuring. Oh, this stick went out to here. So they cut that stick right here. That's why it's got a cut end, right? And they just like would throw that onto a pile. And when I was visiting them, I was like, what is that pile? That pile is awesome nano sticks. And they were like, uh, it's garbage, right? Like every once in a while they would just like burn it or whatever. And so we were like, bag all that up, right? We did that. Well, now we need more. And they're like, well, there's, there's like no more cut ends, right? You used them all up. And so then we offered to pay more money for them. And they still say like, it's not enough money. You're just gonna have to buy these, right? And so for now, there's no more coming. Like the, the co-op effect happened. We, you know, bought thousands of them and then there was no more to be had. And because this is a natural product out of the nature, out of the nature, out of nature, they can't just, you know, make another run of this package of food. Like that's kind of where it's at. So what we have is what we have. And no doubt people are going to be like, when are you going to get more? And the answer is, I don't know. Currently money can't buy it. That's where we're at. Like, I mean, obviously enough money can. Like if I was like, okay, they were 20 bucks. Now they're $200. We got them in stock. Like we're trying to keep the price point so that when they come back in, maybe they're going to be $25 or $27, but not nothing, right? So the first time we ever brought them in, I think I brought in 500 bags, right? And those took a little while to sell and all that. We were testing and that's what I was doing. As I always bring in tests and I test them. Does the market want it? Do we like it? Is it a consistent product in the way that they're put together? That kind of stuff. We sell through those 500. This time we order tons. Well, now we need more, right? Because I finally did a video. Because when I only have 500, I don't do a video because we'll sell out too fast. So now that I did a, like, we've been influenced, we've been using them, and everyone likes them, and the word's gotten out. We're selling tons. 
but now there's not the supply there. So the co-op effect is kind of hurting us on that, you know, and it's, everyone always says that's a good problem to have. Yep. I'm not complaining that, oh man, we sell stuff so well that it's hard to buy it. Like, I'm not complaining about that. I'm just trying to explain why Corey's horrible at his job and doesn't have more nano sticks for people to buy. That's all I'm really trying to like, trust me. I want to buy all the nano sticks that exist, but there's none to be bought currently. So, yeah. Yeah, so someone says, now it'll be gone in two days. Yep, it, it probably will. They'll sell quickly, and there's not a lot I can do about it. That's the unfortunate part. It's, it's really frustrating as a guy. Like, my job is marketing and that kind of stuff, right? So to know, like, you've got a product that sells. People want it. It is a good product. I use it. I myself love it. Oh, I can't get it anymore? Great. Yeah, now I can just still talk about it and do all the promoting, but not make any money off of it because there's no money to be made. So... Make plastic nano sticks. I'm not going to say I would never do that, but I'm very unlikely to do that. There's too many good properties, I think. Like with the nano sticks and plastic, wouldn't be good for shrimp, wouldn't be good for plecos. Like you miss out on some of the inherent good things about the wood itself. So, you know, I won't say never, you know, but unlikely. And there, I'm not saying I would never make a plastic stick, but it needs to do something that like a normal stick wouldn't do. Like it's got to float, it's going to be in a different shape, something that makes sense. Because otherwise I would just rather use the natural product given a choice. So, yeah. All right, let's see if we can find some, some questions. How to choose a guppy in a physical store. What am I looking for? Uh, I'm looking for, I like big guppies. So I like them to be the largest of the group. I like vibrant colors. Uh, sometimes you can ask them to feed them. I want to make sure they're eating. I want to make sure their fins aren't clamped up. I want to make sure they look healthy and good. I want to make sure they don't have weird looking poop. Uh, I want to make sure they don't have like uh, any fin rot going on or damaged tails. Not that I wouldn't buy it, you know, because I can, I know the difference between like, oh, fin rot's going on or yeah, I got damaged in shipping, but it'll be fine. Like, don't let that be the kiss of death for you. But at the same time, like that's what I'm looking for in a perfect world. If you have two guppies that are the same, One's got a damaged tail and one doesn't, but they're same color, same size, same all that. I'll take the one in perfect condition. Um, but that's mostly what I'm looking for is general vitality. Does this look like a strong fish? Does it look like it's thriving? Is it up and about and dancing around the aquarium or is it huddled down in the bottom? You know, I always, I always cringe when someone wants to buy a guppy or someone's kid picks out the guppy in the corner that's not doing anything. Like, are you sure you want that one? Like, I'm not saying it's not healthy, but like of all these other fish that are loving life at the moment, are you sure you want the one that currently has a stomach ache? Because I'll sell it to you, but just know that like if anything goes wrong, we'll make it right. But that's that guy's not winning the race currently. So welcome new member, uh, Rana Loca. Rana Loca? I don't know. Any suggestions on how to keep a Wallstead tank going? I'm planning to start one in my 54 gallon corner. Uh, well, I mean, the most likely culprit of it not going is you getting fed up with it. So what I mean by that is the nutrients last a very long time. You're probably going to want to move plants around from time to time because as creatures, we like to decorate, right? And so if eight months later you want to move the plants around, you're going to uproot all of this um all of this soil it's gonna be on top of the gravel gonna be unsightly kind of oh geez so like that's probably what you're gonna run into is like oh i gotta scoop all this out and start over because when i rescaped it it kind of messed it up like otherwise it just kind of keeps going on like i don't think you're gonna worry about that too much really like it lasts a long time my advice if you're gonna dirt a tank which my first advice is don't but let's assume we're past that only put like a quarter of an inch of soil. People like to put an inch and then another inch of gravel. Don't do that. It only takes just a little bit. Like a quarter inch of soil is a lot of nutrients. And your plants will like grow a little bit slow and they're going to grow the roots. And then one day they're going to tap into the golden land of that soil. And they're going to go, <laughs> right? That just happens a little bit faster when you have this much soil. But when you only have this much soil and you go to replant, most of that soil will never come out of the substrate, so you don't have to worry about it. So that's my tip is like go with a very little, very little bit. Goes a long, long way. And that's 
and this is coming from my experience of like, I'm the guy that's more is better. Let's start with two inches of soil. All right, let's follow what they recommend, one inch. Okay, let's try just a little bit. And I found I got the best growth and the best longevity and all that with just a little bit of dirt, right? That's my, so still do your inch or inch and a half cap of whatever you're gonna do. I don't recommend sand, but gravel, eco-complete, whatever you wanna do. But very little of that soil goes a very long way. So, Welcome, George Hill, to the membership team. What type of filtration do I use for my mud turtles? My mini musks, I use uh, currently a canister filter, which I hate. And I don't hate it because it's just a canister filter. It's just because the tank is low. And it's i got to remove a panel to get to it. So I'm using a, like a Fluval 306, I think. And then I'm using some of the Zis uh, filters, this thingy right here, some of these guys. And I think I'm actually gonna switch to like three or four of these and no cancer filter because these are just easier to maintain because all I gotta do is pop the bottom off, go clean it, put it right back on, protect it from the turtles so they can't eat it, works for me. And I'm big on doing what works for me. Not, not here to impress anyone, just wanna make my life easier. Why don't I recommend sand? Here's here. Let me set the scene for you. You're at the beach. You're laying down. You're getting that tan, right? Ooh, time is good. Life's good. What's all around you? Not plants, right? You're sitting on the beach. and You're like, oh yeah, there's no plants here. Why? Because it chokes out plants. You go you go back from it a little bit. You start getting a little bit more. Oh yeah, there's some dirt and some rocks mixed in with the sand. Oh, plants are growing there. Funny how that works, right? Sand in general compacts down so much, it doesn't allow plants to sufficiently spread their roots, right? And we're gonna go on the nerd level here, but a plant has plant roots that we see, right? When you see those plant roots sticking down, you're like, yeah, those are plant roots, yes. But those aren't what take in the majority of the nutrients. So on that plant root, this is one of those roots that we just had, right? We got this plant root. I mean, tiny little hairs that come off it, tons of little hairs, and they're actually called root hairs, right? And those root hairs are really what are sucking up all those nutrients. And they're kind of like, think of my arm right here is the plant root. Like I can push it through sand, but the arm hair, which I have a lot of, I have a lot of root hairs here. I don't know if you guys can see that, but all those are much weaker and they can't push their way through the sand. So they end up being matted up against the main root. And that doesn't collect nutrients very well. And it naturally is an inhibitor of plants. So because of that compaction in our aquarium, same thing happens. That's, it's not that it could never be done. It's that you're limiting your overall potential by doing it. You're just not going to get nearly as good a growth and it's always going to be an uphill battle. That's just the reality. So that's why I don't recommend sand. And it's also why I have to say it's not that it can't be done. It's just that I don't do it. So that, that's that. Uh, let's see. How to transition Hudson River goldfish to a tank? I've, I've never really transitioned goldfish from the wild. I've transitioned wildfish, but not necessarily, uh, you know, wild goldfish. But in general, keep the water cooler. Like, they're probably going to be used to very cool temps, so don't let them get too warm right off the bat. But, you know, and kind of deworm them and that kind of stuff. They pick up anything in the wild, but nothing else really. Treat them like a normal fish for the most part. I feel like I saw either super chats or some good questions. Let me see here. Hmm. All right. Hmm. I was, I'm reading that my, my wife told me that a fan has dropped something off. And I don't know what it is yet. Picture of it. It's made out of glass. Super cool. Maybe I'll show you guys on the next live stream. Um, my wife has now finished. She says, sorry, my hands are all wrinkly. 23 boxes of plants today headed home. So my wife has been working on that. So that's one of the things that, you know, kind of goes into what we do is I have to head home, prepare for the live stream, get ready. She stays there. She's helping put plants away with all the employees because 23 boxes. Yes, it is 634, which means normally warehouse crew goes home at 430, but we probably had so many plants that people had to work late. And uh, good thing we hired two new people to help out with that, which the, one of them hasn't started yet. So, but let's delve into those super chats. Did I miss one? Yeah, okay, I did miss one. I thought I did. 
Aaron asks, number of brine shrimp or bloodworm cubes to feed? We've got two juvenile epistos, two crebenzas, two Bolivian rams, four corridoras, and seven neons, and a partridge in a pear tree. Struggling to know if I'm overfeeding. So let's think about that. Part of that, that problem is we don't know the size. Like a Bolivian ram could be real small, or it could be like, oh yeah, it's, you know, the big ram, it's fully grown. In general, I, I feel like without knowing the size, so let's take that, like, that's a known thing. I don't know the size. But in general, without more information, I feel like for fish this big, right, apistos, cribs, Bolivian rams, I would probably do one cube per three of those. So you have six total. You got two rams, or I mean two apistos, two cribs, and two, two Bolivian rams. So that'd probably be two cubes right there. Then you've got four corridoras, and seven neons. Seven neons, if they get like one worm each a day, they're probably all right. Corridors, maybe a few worms. So I feel like I'd be somewhere between two and three cubes a day. That's what I would do, depending on size. Now, if they're smaller, like they're not all full grown, maybe you side on the two cubes a day, right? If they're all babies, go with one. All right. How can I try, wait, how can I get rid of nitrites, not nitrates, nitrites, if I have a planted aquarium? It's over 80 parts per million. Everything is on zero, like ammonia nitrite uh, in the 55. Okay, so I did read that correctly. The first one was an error. It said nitrites, actually meant to be nitrates. So you have 80 parts per million nitrates. So a couple of things could be going on. One, if we're fertilizing, we could uh, be over-fertilizing. That could be one thing that's going on. It happens with easy green. Sometimes people get overzealous with it. They're putting in way too much nitrogen. Two, you could be feeding an insane amount. So in this case, even though we're building up a lot of nitrogen, plants can't uptake that unless we have all the other things they want too. So you might actually need to put fertilizer in. So what I would recommend in this scenario is try to get back down to reasonable levels. So I would tell you in a 55 gallon, you've got 80 parts per million. I would tell you do a 50% water change today, wait two days, do another 50% water change. That should lower you to about 20 parts per million nitrates. Then go ahead and dose something like Easy Green, basically some fertilizer, get those plants really growing. And I bet you within a month or so of dosing fertilizer every week, you might find that it's now sitting at zero because the plants are utilizing what you had going on from the food but now also the fertilizer and you're getting gangbuster growth out of that, out of those plants. So that being said, there's always caveats. Like sometimes people say I have a fully planted tank and it's all anubias. Like they're a very slow growing plant. That strategy is not going to work until you get some faster growing plants. So more information might be needed there, but that's what I'd be looking into. All right. Uh, Brandy Swift says, I saw your video about the heaters. Yes, that was quite the video of uh, internet debating. I keep my room temperature between 70 and 72. Can I keep a Royal Pleco without a heater in that room temp? So the biggest takeaway that everyone missed from this video, and I don't say everyone, but most people missed, what you keep your room temperature at is irrelevant. It's what is the water temperature. So you're telling me that you keep your, your room at 70 to 72. That doesn't mean like your aquarium could be 105 or it could be 10 degrees, right? So we need to focus on what is the water temperature of that aquarium. Yes. Does the room temperature play into that fact? Yes. But if I have a bunch of equipment on that tank, it might run at 75, even though you're running your tank at 70 to 72. So that question you just asked me, could I keep uh, a no heater aquarium in a room of 70, 72 and keep a Royal Pleco? The answer is yes, technically, but you could, maybe you don't have a glass top on there. So all the heat's escaping. Maybe you have six power heads because you want a lot of flow because they like the flow and that's creating a lot of heat. Maybe you've got really powerful lighting that's also transferring a bunch of heat. There's all these factors you got to factor in. Now, what I think you're actually asking versus the literal words that were put there is, can I keep a Royal Pleco at 70 to 72 degrees 
in an aquarium? My answer to that is probably, but knowing they're always going to be cold. So what I mean by that is can, can Corey live at 60 degrees? Yes, I can. But I will forever be cold of like trying to get warmer. Like, oh, it's just freezing in this house. Like, whew, wish it was warmer. I will live through that forever. Like that, I will just live through that. But will I be a lot happier at 70 degrees? Yes, in my home, I am a lot happier. So, and I do believe this methodology, and I don't talk about it enough, but I believe every fish can handle one stress factor. So what does that mean? Something that causes stress is a stress factor. Could be temperature, too hot or too cold. Could be not enough food or too much food. Could be pH is off. Could be hardness is off. Could be stray current in the water from electricity. Could be shadows. Could be a fish aggressor. There's all these things that cause stress. I believe fish can handle one of those. You know, it's like, for instance, if there's a kid in my store that's like got a, a popsicle and you're just like watching it like rub the tanks and it's got the stickiest hands ever. It's like, what's this? What's this? And you know instantly you're going to have to wash everything that kid's touching. You can kind of like, all right, I can deal with that. Not going to freak out. But then there might be like, all right, there's a customer yelling at me right now. It's 85 degrees in the shop because it's the middle of summer. And that kid, if he touches another thing with that sticky hand, I'm going to lose my mind, right? Those are stress factors. And when you start compounding them, you get into bad situations. And same thing. Do I believe that fish can live at 70 to 72? I do believe it could. But know that you are already, that is going to be one of the stress factors of it being on the cool side. If anything else, like aggressiveness from another pleco, not getting quite fed enough, it doesn't feel safe, pH is wrong, hardness is wrong, any of those things, you're really going to start seeing some disease outbreak or possibly death once you start stacking those factors on. So uh, that's how I would evaluate that. And I think probably this is me. I would keep a heater in that aquarium if you couldn't already use other equipment to keep it at least 74 degrees. At 74 degrees, uh, most tr tropical fish, like in a fish store, stuff like that, they'll just do fine. Like that's just my own hundreds of tanks, I've experienced it, blah, 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 type of stuff right there. So, uh, Brian D says, Corey, I stopped using heaters on my bed of tanks a year ago. No noticeable change. Now, a very important thing to also recognize is just because you don't notice a change doesn't mean that things didn't change. So, they probably are doing healthy. If they look like they're having the time of their life, they probably are. But realize we make changes all the time for our little micro worlds we manage. We don't see the difference. That doesn't mean that they're not going to die from liver failure two years earlier because we didn't know we were feeding the wrong fish food or whatever, right? So just always have that caveat of just because I'm not seeing that it's detrimental doesn't mean it's not. And I, I will be the first person to admit that. Just because I've been doing something for 10 years doesn't mean I haven't been doing it wrong for the entire 10 years. Uh, what was what was that? Oh, so like, yeah, a lot of people like to bring up that like uh, – You've been recommending heaters forever, and now you're just switching your tune? And like, well, I've gained more information. Visiting more fish farms and asking these people that have hundreds of thousands of fish under their care what temperatures they run. I've visited wild climates and felt how cold the water is and doing that kind of stuff, right? Like I've done that. So as I gain this new information and I've tested things, then I can change my opinion on what I've experienced, right? And this is why I'm always very careful to say what I would do, right? Or in my experience, this is what's happened. And I try to do that as much as possible. I'm sure two out of 10 times I forget to say, this is how I would do it. Or this has been my experience. And it comes out like it's a fact as opposed to an opinion. I try to always give you guys just opinions because facts are so hard to really make sure they're a fact, right? So... Uh, but yes, as I learn and grow in the hobby, I will for sure change what I do. If, if I find that there's a new, better medicine, I've been using the Quarantine Trio for 10 years. If I find there's a new, better medicine tomorrow, I will switch tomorrow because it makes sense. 
And then you'd be like, oh, this guy recommended this thing for years. Like, well, yeah, I didn't know that was better. Like, I never experienced it yet. So, makes sense, right? You guys would rather, wouldn't you rather have me tell you about that as opposed to, like, oh, let's keep it for myself. Like, these guys just never need to know. <laughs> right? So, yeah. Uh, let's see here. Someone's asking about the cover thumbnail photo, what to look out for. That was covered in the very beginning. When this becomes a replay, watch that. It's the first thing that'll come up. And that way we're not getting repeats for <laughs> everyone's been here the whole time. And the people listening on the podcast. What fish work with crayfish can't keep plants? This is a realm that I'm not very experienced with because crayfish are illegal in our state. Um, I did learn something. So I hung out with the shrimp king at Aquashella. And someone was asking, so this is a funny story to me because I thought it was funny. Someone was asking, like, what shrimp can I keep with crayfish? And I, in my mind, and so first I want to apologize to the person that asked this because me telling the story is going to make me seem like I think you're a fool. That's not true at all. Uh, but in my mind, I was like, oh, man, those crayfish are going to eat shrimp. Like, that's just they eat anything they can get their hands on. Like, this is a crazy question to ask, right? But then I was like, hey, Shrimp King, you're there and you're like the go-to guy on crayfish and shrimp. Get over here. Let's talk to this guy, right? And I was like, this gentleman wants to know what shrimp you can keep with crayfish. And then I got schooled hard. I got schooled real hard because uh, Chris was like, oh, well, it depends. Like, are they in the Clarky family, this family, this family, this family, or this family? Depending on what the family they're in is how predatory they are and what they're going to want to do. And then one of the things he mentioned was, a lot of the smaller crayfish only get about four or five inches. They don't eat the shrimp. They actually try to mate with the shrimp, and that ends up killing the shrimp. And, like, wow, I was like, wow, learning a ton, right? Like, I just assumed, like, ah, oh, let me eat these snacks. I'm going to eat you. But I actually learned a ton, and I always love to, like, humble myself, ground myself, and go, here I was thinking this was a stupid question. Not a stupid question, but, like, oh, I know the answer to this. And I just really got schooled and I realized that happens to me every day. That happens to me all the time. And so that's why I try not to be like, that's a stupid question. We shouldn't ask questions. I try to always know that what I know is a truth today could totally not be a truth tomorrow because there's always someone that knows more, studies more, specializes more, new technology came out, new science comes out. What is true today isn't necessarily true tomorrow. And so I was, I found that fascinating. Now, you ask me about what fish work with crayfish and I would love to ask the shrimp king about that because one, he specializes in that. Two, he's going to all the native habitats. He'll know what works well there. And three, I would love to get educated about it. So unfortunately for your $3 here, nautical soul, I don't have a good recommendation for you because I don't want to just make something up and be totally wrong. But that does transition into a story. I was talking with the shrimp king on the phone today and uh, we're in the early planning station, stage, stations, stages of taking a trip next month in May to Israel. We're going to visit Guppy Farms, and he's got to give a few talks, and maybe they'll have me give a couple of talks while I'm there. And uh, there's some other, like, fish things to see. For those of you that don't know, Israel produces a lot of tropical fish. It's a decently sized industry there. They do a lot of koi, a lot of guppies, a lot of other stuff, epistos. And so we're going to try and get some of those fish farms and we've got someone's going to guide us around and Chris is already in the know. There might be some other places we go, but we don't want to talk about that yet uh, in that same trip. Um, but I'm excited for it because it's a place I've never been. They've got a fish market. I love to analyze what other people are doing with fish and it usually makes for good content. So I hope to bring that to you guys and I'm excited about that. And now that that's in my brain, hopefully when we're sitting in a car or an airport, I'll be like, hey, someone asked me. What fish do you really well with crayfish? Do you have any recommendations so that way I can portray that knowledge to the people? So, yeah. All right. A new member, Trisha, welcome. We've got uh, Scott asking a question. I have an established planted 55 running a Fluval 406. How long after adding a sponge filter is it okay to take off the 406? Uh... My minimum is one week, but my maximum is a lot longer. So my first question is like, are we in a rush? If the answer is no, like if you've run that cancer filter for years and now you decide, I just want to go with a sponge filter, I would tell you like, 
how about we just wait like a month? Like, do we have anything to lose? Not really, right? Like, what's one more month? So I would say that. But if for some reason we got to make that change quickly, a week is the minimum. And what I typically do would give it a week. And then when I take that cancer filter off, I would feed like one fifth of the amount of food I would normally feed, like very light. And then I might skip the next day. And then I might feed half as much food on the third day. Then I might skip a day. And then I might feed the full amount on that fifth day. And I skip a day. And then I might feed the full amount again. And then I feed the full amount again the next day. So I kind of step it back up just to make sure this filtration, all this bacteria is going to keep pace. You know, because I, you know, that like this is done, this starts type of thing is a lot more rigid and uh, more likely to see a, a problem real quick there if you're going to do it that way. Uh, buddy for my beta for algae. Say that times five times fast. Buddy for my beta for algae. Buddy for beta for my algae. Buddy for my beta for algae. Buddy for my beta for algae. That was actually easier than I thought. 10-gallon tank. Wanted a snail, but scared it will escape. Plants in the tank. Pothos out of the top. No other fish. Just a beta. Uh, so with a snail, sometimes they'll attack those antenna antennae, so you have to test that. In terms of, it's a 10 gallon tank, that's nice. You could say autosynclus, but when they run out of algae, that might be a problem. What I personally would do, this is my recommendation that will set the internet on fire. I personally would buy a reticulated hillstream loach to keep in that aquarium. Now, the internet will say they want to be very cold. How'd this get back in the shot? The internet will say they want to be very cold or cool water, and bettas want to be very warm water. In my experience, I've bred hillstream loaches at very hot water. I've also bred them at very cool water. I've kept betta fish in that range as well. And so I would say maybe you're keeping both at 75 or 78 or even 80, and I think they'll both cohabitate well, and the... Um, the reticulated hillstream loach I find is easier to keep solo and easier to feed than autosynclus are once it runs out of the algae. And because it's a very flat-bodied fish and can get into crevices, it can escape some of the aggression if that aggression is shown. And it's as good at eating the algae, probably the type you want. So that's what I would do. That's what I would test, knowing that if it doesn't work, you know, if I'm bringing home a new dog to meet my dogs and my dogs hate that dog and after three or four days still not working, Obviously, I got to find a new home for that new dog, right? Same thing with, with our fish tanks. All right. Michael Swindle says, would love to become a member, but I can't see a join link anywhere following the link that was posted. Uh, what could be going on, Michael, is if you live in another country, that can be a hindrance. So sometimes, like maybe Canada, maybe outside the U.S., Sometimes it could be because you're on an iPhone. Like there's all these weird quirks of like no one can play nice with each other. And so, um, yeah, that could be going on. Or it could just be like some other bugs going on. But hopefully try a different device if you want to become a member. And then Google it. Google your country and YouTube membership. And then it might be like, oh, like we had a guy that I assume a guy. It could be a female. We had a, a fan that lived in uh algeria and it turned out algeria was a country that could not become a member so um yeah sometimes we're limited by that don't know but hopefully uh it gets figured out for you because there's nothing worse than when you have someone that wants to support you but can't so we have canadian members so it looks like canadia canadia <laughs> canada's good to go you know canadia and uh so yeah i don't know well definitely with like all the mods will try and help you you know they all want to they all want to make sure we see success here, so uh, we'll do what we can. Yeah. All right. Uh, be careful when you travel to Israel. Uh, have you heard something you call it Jerusalem syndrome? Uh, I have not heard of that. I will look into it. I know that, and I have no idea if this correlates to that, but I, whenever I travel to a new country, I do some research, and I know there are specific illnesses that are local to there. I know that there are maybe political threats based on me being an American or not, you know, like it's, it's a good practice in my opinion, when you go to a foreign country to know, like know some things you should and should not do. And like, here's the things to watch out for. And here's the things not to worry about. And 
and all that. And that's one of the reasons why I want to go with Chris, the Shrimp King. He's already been to a lot of these places. He knows the etiquette of a lot of these places. He has friends in a lot of these places. And that just makes all of these things easier when you have someone that's already well-traveled in that space and then go, hey, by the way, guy, don't do this. Like, that's a bad thing. Don't do that or whatever, you know. So, yes, I will try to be uh, careful and that's been on our mind a lot lately. So lately I've been having lots of meetings with uh, insurance companies. And uh, today we had a two hour meeting with an estate planner, you know, to put, we're going to be putting some of our assets into trusts and that kind of thing. Because the reality is I had to get celebrity insurance essentially, because I'm deemed by insurance companies to be a public figure. Uh, I'm a very high risk target to have some crazy fan come after me or me say something wrong about someone and then I get sued. Uh, and then also like in two weeks I'll be in, in Florida and uh, maybe I'll get eaten by a crocodile. Like there's those kind of things going on. And then I travel to another country and maybe I get kidnapped or not. Or maybe I just, you know, I, I walk off a cliff and die on accident because I didn't know not to walk over that cliff. So we're doing all these things to make sure that one, the business is protected. Two, uh, like my wife's protected, I'm protected. And there's all these scenarios I've never thought about before. Like, let's say a crocodile gets a hold of me and I can't work anymore. Like, how do we make sure the business keeps going? How do I, or like, you know, let's say I fall off a cliff and I'm unconscious for seven weeks. What is the business going to do? Who has access to the money? All this kind of stuff. That's what like this whole estate planning thing happens is not only do they plan when you die, but they're also planning like if something crazy was to go down next week and you couldn't touch your business for six weeks at all, who's got access to the bank accounts? Who's got access to pay off that credit card? Who's got access to order stuff? Like could the business keep going on? You know, and maybe I just like maybe something happens where like I just have to have a horrible surgery or something. So we're, we're working on all that. And uh, yeah, so spending lots of time. Uh, making sure we're doing things as safely as possible, knowing that we are doing some risky stuff. And I don't want to paint other countries as like exponentially more risky, but inherently being somewhere where you're not familiar with, not speaking a language is more risk than being in my own house. Like that's just a true statement. Uh, so yeah, definitely trying to be careful. All right. Uh, why do you think you, all right, hold on. Why do you think we don't keep many U.S. natives some natives like the rainbow darter, greenside darter, and Everglades pygmy sunfish are just colorful, are just as colorful as non-native fish. Uh, I think part of it, like in my state, it's illegal for me to collect them. It would also be illegal for me to sell them. So there's some of that stuff going on. Uh, two, I think it's just not popular. I think I fully believe that like if myself and Joey and a few other big fish YouTubers. That might be unfair. I shouldn't necessarily classify myself, classify myself in the same league as someone with a million subscribers. But if a bunch of influential fish people were to keep them and they're, they are great looking fish, then I think more people would ask for them and then that might start that trend. I just think no one's doing it. And so that is part of, truth being told, that is part of the reason I'm going to collect in Florida and that kind of stuff. I want to highlight invasive species. I want to highlight native species. I want to look at native habitats. I want to see habitats that are being destroyed. I want to visit fish farms. I want to ask some of these questions. I want to do these things, right? Like that's the next evolution in my content, I believe, is to like, let's start answering some of these questions on why we're not doing this. Like sticklebacks are very popular, or I shouldn't say very popular, much more popular in Europe. Europe treats Native American, not Native American, Native fish to America uh, in a much higher regard than we do. The rainbow shiner, gorgeous fish, there's all these fish that are gorgeous and for some reason I think because they're in our backyard, they're not exotic, right? And so I think by keeping some of them and showing that, we will get past that. There are some natives that we do keep all the time, like Florida flagfish, Hedoranda formosa, those are some of those, but some things like the darters and the, like the Everglades, uh, Everglades, the eye, pygmy sunfish, they're so hard to get to adapt to non-live foods that it makes it difficult. Now, one of the reasons that it might be really popular in Europe compared to here is 
live foods, you can buy at the local like PetSmart-esque store. They'll have 15 different types of live foods. You can just buy them, and they're very cheap, and they're easy. We don't have that here in America. So when you're keeping a fish that typically only eat live food, it's much more work for us to do it because we can't just go and spend $3 a week and feed our fish on those live foods. Instead, we'd have to culture them or much worse, we got to order them in or something like that. So I think that's part of it. But, you know, I'll know a lot more in a year after doing these trips and talking to people and looking at it and really, you know, put my own two eyes on it. Which I've collected, by the way, I've collected not the darters, uh, but I have collected pygmy sunfish before in Florida. So, you know, I have seen their habitat. $5 super chat from Kathy. Thank you. Appreciate that. Joel saying, let's go catch some fish. Yes, my my goal, and this isn't like an open invite or anything like that. My goal is reconnaissance missions in Florida. Find some cool spots. Make sure it's reasonably safe. Do all that. And then bring some people along to enjoy it. You know, maybe that's bringing Joel. Maybe that's bringing some other YouTubers. I don't know. I don't want to commit to anything yet. Maybe down the road, it's like everyone signs a waiver and then we all stay at this hotel and then we all go play in the water together, right? Like it's not aquarium co-op taking you fish collecting because you're gonna get eaten by an alligator. But if you wanna show up, I'm eating tacos at mile marker 45 on this river, right? That type of thing. So uh, yeah, that's, it's all wanna make sure that it's as fun as I can make it and that type of thing for myself. For you guys watching, if you guys ever show up, if anyone else ever shows up, um, yeah, that's just, that's that's the truth. Seven o'clock, that means we are done for the week. Uh, we do two hours, as you guys probably know. I'll see you next Wednesday. That's a true statement, because I will be in town. And uh, yeah, so we'll see you next week. I'll Maybe I'll post again on Facebook and ask what you guys want me to talk about. I hope you enjoyed the first hour of all those, if you see this sign, do this. Uh, if you want to do me a big old favor, go buy all of our things on the website, whether it's the, the new USB air pump, whether it's a Pleco cave, whether it's a sponge, whether it's fish food or dechlorinate or any of that. Hopefully our pricing is in line with what you want to be paying uh, compared to your local store, your local source. And if it makes sense, buy from us. If it doesn't, no hard feelings. If we don't sell to you, I'm a bad guy. I know it. We're trying. If you're outside of the USA, we're seeing what we can do about that. It's a slow, steady uh, movement on that. But I thank you guys for showing up. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you next week, I guess. Unless I fall off a cliff in Israel, right? That'd be bad. <laughs>